cast your mind back to 1975. I mean, I can't because I didn't exist, but if I could, maybe I'd think about Gerald Ford congratulating the crew of the first joint US-USSR space mission and watching the Apollo capsule dock with the Soyuz space station. Perhaps me being me, I might think about the arrival of Betamax and VHS, or more likely the Altair 8800, or maybe the first attempt to introduce a federal gay rights bill. But something else happened that year. The US, enduring a second year of an oil embargo, introduced standards for fuel economy. The US had already instituted a national speed limit of 55 miles per hour back in 1973, the lower speed limit pushing up efficiency and decreasing road deaths. But still desperate to get energy consumption down, the home of big V8s and V12s needed to promote more efficient vehicles. And so in came the Corporate Average Fuel Economy, or CAFE standards. They first kicked in in 1978, and since then those standards have been adjusted and tweaked and nudged fuel economy up. Automakers have continually fought these standards for as long as they have been around, sometimes winning and sometimes losing, and these standards have dramatically influenced the cars we can buy. But recently, as we reported in 10, we've got a twofer which might play out to massively shift the scales on electrification. So let's find out what's going on. Okay, so the headline news here is that there are new rules that have been separately proposed by the United States Department of Energy and the Environmental Protection Agency, both of which are separately addressing vehicle pollution, but which, if both make it to being enacted, could together combine to make EVs the dominant vehicle, and at the same time start to close a loophole that's encouraged US vehicles to turn into the massively oversized SUVs and trucks that suck environmentally and in terms of pedestrian safety. At 40 miles per hour, 100% of pedestrians struck by an SUV died, versus about 50% when struck by a regular car. The N was small in this study, but the difference persisted at lower speeds where the N was bigger. Before we get stuck in, it's worth remembering something important here. Unlike new federal laws which are passed by both Senate and House before being signed into law by the President, these proposed changes are rules issued by those two federal agencies, which are each charged by federal law to come up with appropriate standards and rules on behalf of the executive branch. You know, the President, or as some people call him, Dark Brandon. Okay, so let's look at these things separately and then talk about how they interact, because like I say, there's a few different bits going on. First up, let's talk about the CAFE standards and what they are, and the proposed changes. So for those who don't know, the CAFE standards are an average fuel efficiency for the car and truck fleet, which is calculated for each manufacturer. If an auto manufacturer doesn't hit the CAFE average for the fleet of vehicles sold in a given year, it's fined. And last year, the National Highway Traffic and Safety Agency, or NHTSA, announced that fines were going to more than double, to $15 per 0.1 miles per gallon per vehicle sold, which didn't meet the requirements, which can add up pretty quickly. Now, like many things in the world of regulations, the way these standards are set isn't absolutely straightforward to understand. CAFE standards are regulated by NHTSA, which is a branch of the Department of Transportation. NHTSA sets and enforces the standards, but it's actually the EPA which runs the numbers and at the same time sets other greenhouse gas standards. So basically NHTSA makes some of the rules, but the EPA actually does the math. And two years ago, the Natural Resources Defense Council and the Sierra Club, both environmental non-profits in the US, petitioned the Department of Energy and said, fundamentally, Hey ladies, the rules you're using for this calculation are bovine byproduct, and y'all need to get with the times. Because the last time that the formula for calculating the impact of EVs have on the average fuel economy was updated, the market was a very, very different place. That last update was in 2000, when you'd have just missed your opportunity to hop right out and lease a Honda EV Plus. 
because they'd been discontinued. So maybe if you were lucky you could instead pick up one of the 328 first generation Toyota RAV4 EVs that they actually sold. Or if you could roll a natural 20 maybe you could get your hands on a GM EV1 lease. If you were after a pickup well, you'd already missed out on Chevy's lease, only Chevy S10 EV, because that had been discontinued for a couple of years. But, but the Ford Ranger EV still had a couple of years left in it, if you were lucky. And that was your list of options. I mean, there were other options, mainly converted gas cars, but those were the vehicles most people think of as being available EVs back then. The calculation actually has an adjustment to allow for gas fueled heating for EVs because the rule makers were concerned that the limited range available from the batteries of the time might mean automakers decided to use fossil fuels to heat the cabin which would also impact their emissions. And so the DOE felt it made sense then to include a massive incentivization to coax automakers into building EVs. And that was done by massively multiplying the impact of the fuel economy of an EV. So while the CAFE standard does use the same underlying efficiency calculation that you see on the window sticker, the MPGE, it then applies a massive fudge factor to make up for the fact that, to all intents and purposes, there were no clean vehicles available and the DOE wanted there to be more than none. So if they could get a manufacturer to produce a couple of thousand and sell them rather than say 300 and some RAV4 EVs that actually got sold, then the manufacturer would get a big pat on the head, a gold star, and a leg up on meeting the fuel efficiency requirement. Fast forward to now with Europe and some US states transitioning to 100% EV for new car sales by 2035. Nearly 80% of sales in Norway being EVs, about 20% of Norway's entire car fleet is EVs incidentally, and roughly 25% of new vehicle sales in China already being EVs not to mention an ever-growing number of EVs from different automakers showing off how EVs are just better than gas cars, and the argument is that the fudge factor isn't needed anymore. And the plan is, thanks to those petitions from the Natural Resources Defence Council and the Sierra Club, to basically kick that fudge factor to the curb, and the potential impact of that is huge. At the moment the MPGE that you see on the window sticker say for the Kia Nero EV, that's 113 mpge, is tweaked by that fudge factor to get the number used in cafe calculations, which is a staggering 394.3 mpge. By removing the fudge factor and using a more realistic value for each vehicle, automakers will need to sell around three to four times as many EVs to get the same amount of average emissions improvement they're currently getting from selling just one car. So that's the first thing, which is potentially big by itself. The second thing is that coincidentally the EPA announced its proposed rule changes for updated fleet greenhouse gas standards. Now this proposed rule has lots of components which cover quite a few areas. One interesting and related but not thing is mandating a minimum battery lifespan of 80% of original capacity at 5 years and 70% at 8 years for electric vehicles. That's predicated on the concept that gasoline rules mandate that gasoline engines maintain near new efficiency if properly maintained for their working life, and that there is a carbon output inherent in building batteries, so they need to last a good chunk of time for this math to work. As we've seen from plenty of studies recently, basically all EVs on the market easily surpass this standard because lithium-ion batteries, it turns out, last much better than we thought. It also starts work on closing the loopholes that have allowed, nay, encouraged US automakers to build huge vehicles. And interestingly, that started with chickens. Back in the 1960s, Europe was rather miffed. And in foreign news, the United States is selling chicken in Europe, the European Economic Community states is being sold at below production cost, and may contain dubious growth substances. As a result, EEC member states have agreed to implement tariffs on imported chicken from the 
former British colony. In retaliation, the US put tariffs on potato starch, dextrin, brandy, and thanks to hard work by the Union of Auto Workers, who were concerned about the loss of American auto sales to smaller, more efficient, more reliable, and cheaper European vehicles, the US also added a 25% tariff on foreign light trucks. Some have argued that by insulating parts of the US auto industry from foreign competition, the ability of US automakers to compete in those segments in the world market has been damaged, and that US vehicles in those segments are undeveloped in terms of efficiency and quality. But what that tariff definitely did do was start the ball rolling on making light trucks and later SUVs, which were originally built on a separate, often pickup chassis, its own special category in the US. To some extent that made sense when the rules were introduced, because who in the 1970s in their right mind would drive a rattly, noisy, gas-guzzling pickup or SUV unless they absolutely had to for work? But since then, because they existed in their own category, SUVs and pickups, which were work and vehicles, were both allowed to pollute more and required less stringent crash testing. And for US automakers, they were free of competition, so guess which ones US automakers decided to make? Which is why US automakers are so keen to keep both the tariff and the loopholes. So in this proposed rulemaking, there are a couple of important details. The first and biggest is that while there isn't a requirement to hit a specific degree of market penetration for zero emission vehicles, nor disappointingly a requirement to be 100% zero emission by a certain date, the carbon dioxide emissions requirement, that is 82 grams per mile on average by 2032, a drop of 56% from the 2026 target, will mean that automakers have to sell far more zero emission vehicles than they would under the old standards. The justification for this includes an interesting tidbit that in segment by segment comparisons, the EPA document states that where a BEV is available, buyers prefer them to the gasoline variant. This is definitely my surprised face. Also, in a situation which I think might be described as either karmic justice or perhaps hoist by their own petard, after decades of pushing back on climate policy, all the bluster from automakers about quite definitely being mostly electric by some rapidly approaching year is used as a justification for stating that automakers can achieve these goals. It must be possible, they say, because they said so themselves, you see? Publicly. A lot. The proposed rulemaking also discusses how to tackle that loophole that incentivizes building SUVs and light trucks that people are basically using as shopping cart come death machines instead of driving a regular car. Closing this loophole has been an ongoing challenge. For example, back in 2001, Senator Markey, back when he was a wee little representative, he attempted to close that loophole with the Markey Amendment, which would have removed the artificial separation of SUVs from passenger cars. That, thanks to industry pressure, didn't go anywhere, and it's far from the only attempt. Annoyingly, this proposal doesn't remove the distinction, but does rejig the groupings and adjust the medium-duty passenger vehicle, or MDPV, a category that came into force with the 2017 Tier 2 emissions rules, which includes vehicles like SUVs and medium-duty pickups, which are being used in place of a passenger car to capture more of the SUV market. It also includes what the youth might describe as a sick burn, stating by way of example that the new GM Hummer pickup and SUVs are over 10,000 pounds GVWR due to battery weight, but do not have significant work capabilities. Which is true mind, but also ouch. Anyhow, punting this one down the road somewhat, the EPA states that it, quote, plans to monitor vehicle market trends over the next several years to identify any new trends that could potentially lead to the loss of emissions reductions, and if so, to explore appropriate ways to address such a situation. To which I feel like saying, honey, that horse is not only bolted, but it's also set up a new stable, won multiple races, and now has little foley children running around. Because last year, SUVs and trucks made up 80% of new vehicle sales. So allowing them to have more regulations is... How should I put this? Not ideal. 
but the changes to the vehicle footprint curves, which make the differences between MDPVs and light passenger vehicles smaller, should hopefully reduce that build ginormous wheeled monstrosities incentive. However, with all that said, the impact of this guidance would be, the EPA predict, that 67% of vehicles sold will be zero emissions by 2032 in some form or another. It's likely there'll be battery electric vehicles, but there's no technical requirement for that to be the case. And if automakers want to build entirely fuel cell vehicles, then they could. But that technology is, as it always has been, about five to ten years away from commercialization, apparently. Now, the CAFE standards and the EPA's greenhouse gas standards, or we'll call them EPA GHG, are separate beasts. But the two are aligned. CAFE credits can only be traded within the CAFE program, which is how Tesla made a lot of money early on, and EPA GHG credits can similarly be traded within the EPA GHG program. That means that a manufacturer that's way ahead of the curve on zero emission vehicles can trade extra credits to, oh, I don't know, Mazda to pick an automaker completely at random, which might not, for some completely unknown reason, have sold enough MX-30 EVs to meet the emissions requirements. Which remains a concern because it does provide a get-out-of-jail kinda free card for automakers who aren't willing to commit to building zero-emission vehicles. And at the moment, that's not changing, which isn't great. The penalties are also separate. We talked about the cafe penalties earlier, but the EPA's penalties can also add up reasonably quickly, being up to $45,268 per non-compliant vehicle or engine. That's because each non-compliant vehicle sold is a violation of the Clean Air Act. Obviously, because automakers can still trade credits under the new rules, these fines can be easy to avoid because they can just buy credits from, say, a 100% clean vehicle maker that sells quite a lot of cars. It's Tesla. They buy them from Tesla. But the thing is, what we could get theoretically here is a bit of a force multiplier. If the EPA's new rule goes into effect, or better still, its alternative one, which is stricter, then the world is going to become an increasingly uncomfortable place for fossil fuel vehicle makers. Because with markedly decreasing allowable fleet emissions, and not being ridiculously overcredited for each EV a maker sells, then the only way out is to actually build and sell zero emission vehicles. And the more EVs that are on the road, the less call there is for the infrastructure to support gas cars. And so the more inconvenient owning a gas car will be. It could be a virtuous circle. And if we can do this equitably, then that would be a very good thing indeed. Incidentally, the EPA and DOT rules will be open for public comment for 60 days once they're officially posted. So if you feel like it, there are links in the description and on screen QR codes to make that happen, if you want to get involved. We do. That's it for today. And on that note, we are done with today's video. If you have comments, drop us a polite note in the Discord chat room, on Mastodon, or if you're a Patreon supporter, in the comments there. If you want more, subscribe, hit the bell, and follow the links below to regularly support us with a YouTube membership or Patreon subscription. You'll also find links to our Ko-fi, Bitcoin, and Swag store, as well as that aforementioned Mastodon server. Scrolling by on my right is our amazing list of charged up supporters, and shoutouts go to our Vita G Patreon supporters, Pedro Muro Pinheiro, Alan Tupper, Andrew Martin, Bennett Elder, Brophy Wolf, Chris Maxwell, Cyprian Laplace, Dan Blair, Gordon C., Hey Esker, John Trammell, Kyle Fox, Mark Eggleton, Peter Dillinger, Regine Fellows, Sean Tucker, Stefan Fremton, Stephen Williams, Tesla in the Gong, Paul Bricknell, Tony Moss, Kyle Hodgson, Chris Asenta, Denny Hyde, Lance Schall, Linda Irish, Mike Wader, and Paul Nelson. And finally, big thanks to our off-grid supporters Paul Conway, Kevin Burrowbridge, Stephen O'Donoghue, Jim Burness, Robert Flannery, Aaron Han, Ellery Hensley, Rory Litwin, JP Fagerback, Dave Kitchen, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, Chris and Michael Johnson, Clay Witt, CPU Freak 101, Eric Knack, Joe Bresney, Joe Hughes, John Henderson, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, Nigel S, Reggie Watts, Will Graylin, and of course, Ian. 
Don't forget we make videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday and Saturday on the main channel plus Sunday on Take Two and with that I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you soon and as always keep evolving!